Hello, hello. I'm Jay, and you're watching DS Tech Media. And we're going to try something new. We're going to be doing the news. And we're going to be calling it RSS News. Because a lot of the stuff I'm going to be grabbing straight from my RSS feed reader. First piece of news is Akira. A Linux design tool. So Akira's purpose is about giving freedom to designers who want to use open source. Uh, Akira is from developer Alessandro Castellani. Castellani. He's a Linux developer and user, and he has been for years. He's the first to admit the current status of the Linux desktop doesn't allow designers to be productive and competitive in a world dominated by extremely fast, reliable, and modern proprietary applications for Mac OS and Windows. Akira's purpose is to drastically change that. Basically, it's going to be an open source alternative to Figma or Sketch. There's only 16 days left with 501 backers. The goal is $48,859. And as of right now, they've only raised 14382 I'm really excited about this project. I still plan on backing in the two weeks remaining. And I recommend anyone who is a designer on Linux please consider backing this project. This is this is something that I've really, really wanted for a while now. Let's go ahead and watch the video. Designing interfaces on Linux will never be the same. Introducing Akira. Akira is a native Linux application for UX designers. It approaches the creation of user interfaces with a modern and intuitive workflow comparable to the other proprietary design applications currently leading the industry. Akira is native, not an electron hub hungry for your memory. Akira is open source, guaranteeing its longevity and support from the community. Akira is free, no subscription, no upgrading fees, no features locked behind a paywall. Akira is the design tool we've all been waiting for. Help us boost its development and release the first version to completely change the Linux design ecosystem. Akira needs you. Linux needs Akira. Right, so um, yeah, he even went so far as to break down the budget and what he plans to do with the money. It's going to be written entirely in Vala and GTK3. And it's going to be built with Mason. And the icons will be custom made respecting the SVG standard. And he's going to launch it on Elementary OS's App Center. And as a flat pack, daily builds will be available through the official PPA. We're open to implement or accept contributions or other distribution formats like Snap or App Image. It'll be fully native, adaptable interface, vector SVG based canvas, shapes, layers, font manager, save in different formats, export formats. I've actually used a uh, Philip Scott, Felipe Escoto. I've used I use Notes Up, I use Spice Up and Elementary. Bilal El Mausali. I use Feed Reader. I'm gonna be using that in a moment. He worked on Flathub, Genobe. Very cool, very, very cool. Please, please consider backing this project. Okay, up next, uh, this is from Joey Snedden at Oh My God, Ubuntu. 
Google adding app search to Chrome OS app launcher. Pharonix, uh apparently read-only Apple file system supports being worked on for the Linux kernel, APFS. Past few years, Apple's been developing APFS as a successor to the long-used HFS Plus. Apple file systems in use with macOS 10.13 and iOS 10.3 and the other platforms. For offering a lot of features not found in HFS Plus, including much better performance, APFS kernel driver now available under development for Linux operating system. Uh, Wine 4.0 came out. And this was written by Uncool Stash at It's False. Facebook to encrypt Instagram messages ahead of integration with WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. DirectX Vulkan 96 release with more optimization and game fixes. Actually, I believe this is pretty old. This is from the 28th, I think. DXVK 1.1 is out now. Something makes me very sad. Google Plus for consumers will shut down on April 2nd. It's no secret that Google planned to pull life support from the consumer version of Google Plus. It's failure of a social network in April. Until now, we didn't know the exact date. The date Google announced today is April 2nd. On that date, Google will start deleting all content, including Google Plus pages, photos, and videos, and everything else on the site. If you were one of the last few Google Plus users, which I am, or just feeling nostalgic about the stuff you posted there, now it's time to download all of that data. Valve publishes initial Steam figures for Linux. Steam's Linux market share ended 2018 at around 0.82% for the month of December, which has been rising in recent months following Valve's rollout of Steam Play for allowing Windows games to run on Linux with the Steam client using their Wine-based Proton and DXVK. Earlier in 2018, prior to Steam Play, the Linux market share was as low as 0.28 to 0.3%. Among the all-time lows is the least percentage basis for the portion of Linux gamers on Valve's platform. Now for January 2019, Steam metrics with this year's marking 7 years since Valve rolled out the official Steam Linux client the percentage of Linux users strikes 0.82%. Yep, at least if the numbers are accurate this month, the Linux percentage is flat for January 2019. Meanwhile, the January 2019 figures show Windows growing by 0.06 to 95.92%, while macOS dropped by 0.04% to 3.27%. So there may be some slight changes in the Linux percentage, but nothing drastically significant, and still below the 1% mark. Of course, with Steam overall user base likely growing each month unless the Epic Game Stores or the like has taken enough hit yet, total Linux gamer base might be larger now than one month ago, but not on a percentage basis up against macOS and Windows. As for Linux specific stats, they show among Steam Linux gamers that Intel still commands around 79 point, I'm sorry, 79% of the CPU market share, and the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1060 remains the most popular graphics card, and 1080p still reigns on half systems polled. Haiku OS ports more networking drivers from BSD and other kernel progress. The Haiku Open Source Project, Operating System Project, inspired by BOS, is out with their newest monthly report on the happenings. Following the long-awaited Haiku Release 1 beta a few months ago, Haiku developers remain as motivated as ever for advancing the long-standing operating system effort. Some of their latest achievements include better handling for non-fixed width fonts, fixed sub-pixel font rendering in their app server, and an overhaul of the free BSD compatibility layer in order to accommodate FreeBSD's new Ethernet driver subsystem. 
with the latest FreeBSD compatibility work, the Ethernet and Wi-Fi driver from BS FreeBSD 12 have been finished. Porting over to Haiku OS, other improvements to this compatibility layer make the startup process faster and also will allow for porting USB support in the future. In the kernel space, they've also been working on EFI boot improvements, refactoring their kernel thread structure, handling code, and other improvements. More details on this work can be found on haikuos.org, and it comes from Pharonix. <laughs> and here's some more bad news for Facebook. This is from TechCrunch. Facebook warned over piracy risks of merging messaging platforms. Privacy risks, my bad. And yeah, they, they're just leaking data all over the place. And now they're going to merge three huge communication platforms. And allegedly they're going to add encryption to Instagram Messenger. Netflix continues experiencing great performance using FreeBSD for their CDN. It's been a love affair going on for years. Should you not already know Netflix has long been leveraging FreeBSD as part of its in-house content delivery network for serving its millions of users with on-demand video. This weekend at FOSDEM, Jonathan Looney of the company talked about their usage of FreeBSD. Those wanting to learn more about Netflix usage of FreeBSD that missed out on the presentation at FOSDEM in Brussels, there's a PDF slide deck available. And these, uh, these are their servers that run FreeBSD. And basically, uh, their most in-demand content gets hosted on these servers in places like uh, Ashburn, Virginia, which is like a huge internet hub. And that way they can deliver this content in the fastest. At least that's how I understand it. Pipewire should be one of the exciting Linux desktop technologies for 2019. So Pipewire uh, is actually like a new media system for Linux. And it's going to integrate with uh, GStreamer. And it wants to replace Pulse Audio and a lot of ALSA applications. So... It'll, you know, we have some applications that access also directly. It would kind of merge some things. It would also be able to uh, integrate with Jack and handle all your Jack connections. It would be a more seamless way to route audio and video on Linux. Because right now it's it's pretty messy. No, this is real irrelevant. They're already at release candidate 6. LXD for Linux containers had a very fruitful 2018. While Canonical often takes heat for the various project forks, their work on LXD for further innovating atop LXC for Linux containers has really paid off. Over the past few years, LXD has really evolved into quite capable system container management beast. Stefan Graber of Canonical talked at FOSDEM in Brussels yesterday about LXD over 2018 and its many accomplishments. The biggest achievement for the project continues to be led by Canonical is that LXD now ships on all Chromebooks as part of its container support for running Linux applications. That's awesome, I did not know that. I actually, I've used LXD um, just, just playing around with it. I haven't used it like for anything meaningful. Those wanting to learn more about the current state for LXD can see Graver's PDF slide deck again. Raspberry Pi versus new Pine 64 board, same price, <laughs> but H64 has two times the memory. Uh, 
uh, System 76's new Darter Pro laptop. Ships at $999 and up. Current Darter Pro pricing puts it more competitive than the recently updated Dell XPS Developer Edition, which comes in a 13 inches, but with arguably better build quality and warranty. Game mode sees patches to allow for GPU overclocking when running Linux games. Mark de Louise. Mark Deluzio continues working on interesting features for game mode as the daemon to optimize Linux systems for gaming. The latest is integrating AMD and NVIDIA overclocking support within game mode, which is now under review. The AMD GPU kernel driver and NVIDIA binary Linux driver have long offered overclocking support on Linux via their respective interfaces. With this, Game mode integration, it allows the automatic setting of the overclocking state when a game is run and triggers game mode. And then the ability to easily return to your default clocks and power state when you aren't gaming in order to reduce heat output and lower power consumption. This game mode GPU overclocking works with both drivers, though in case of NVIDIA driver you must have already enabled the cool bits extension needed to expose their clock controls. Patches are out for review, and here's another Pine64. Pine64 to launch open source phone, laptop, tablet, and camera. This is on Linux.com. Pine Phone Development Kit based on the Quad A53 All Winner A64 driven So Pine A64 module. The Pine Phone will run mainline Linux and support alternative mobile platforms such as UB ports, MAMO, Lesta. Postmarket OS and Plasma Mobile. It can also run Unity 8 and KDE Plasma with Lima. This upgradable modular phone kit will be available soon in limited quantity and will be spun off later this year or in 2020 into an end user phone with target price of $150. Pinebook Pro, like many upcoming Pine64 products, the original Pinebooks Limited. Edition developer systems. The Pinebook Pro, however, is aimed at a broader audience that might be considering a Chromebook. The second gen Pro laptop will replace the $99 and up 11.6 inch version of the Pinebook. The original 14 inch version may receive an upgrade to make it more like the Pro. And the $200 Pinebook Pro advances from the quad core. Cortex A53 All Winner H64 to the Hexacore A53 and A72 Rock Chip RK3399. It supports mainline Linux and BSD. More advanced features include a higher resolution 14 inch 1080p screen now with IPS panel as well as twice the RAM, which is 4 gigs of low power DDR4. It offers 4 times the storage at 64 gigabytes with a 128 gigabyte option for registered developers. Other highlights include USB 3.0 and 2.0 ports and a USB type C port. So I was actually uh, really, really stoked for Pine64. And uh, I was was considering buying Pinebook, but I've seen a lot of terrible reviews about things taking forever to show up and being broken when they do show up and having absolutely non-existent customer support. So that really made me pause when it comes to ordering them. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was the video editors. Lightworks Video Editor shares its plans for 2019. Olive is a new open source video editor aiming to take on biggies like Final Cut Pro. Located on Live and Shot Cut are there, but they don't offer and meet the standards of professional video editing. That's what many Linux users have expressed. I personally disagree. I think Hidden Live is great. Of course, I'm not professional, so. And you can install it via all of these methods. And I'll be adding links to a lot of the articles in the show notes. Also, with videos, Flowblade 2.0 GTK3 based Linux video editor now available for those trying to find a suitable non linear open source Linux video editing solution that fits your needs. Flowblade 2 is now available for this 
decade old video editor that is arguably not as well known as the likes of Caden Live and OpenShot. Flowblade 2.0 comes with the largest workflow and user experience improvements since the early days of the project. Comes with a new custom GTK theme. Also features better tooltip coverage, various GUI updates, a transform compositor, and other changes as outlined in the release notes. Matt Hartley over Freedom Penguin posted uh, five Linux apps that he's excited about, and one of them was Video Editor Cinelera Good Guy Infinity Edition. That is actually looking like a, a, a decent advance forward for Cinelera. I never considered using Cinelera as a video editor before, but I might now. Might as well take a look. Features and plugins for color correction, motion tracking, video stabilization, audio mastering, and much, much more. Over 400 decoders and over 150 encoders. 8K support, supports LV2 plugins, multi camera support, proxy support, uh, smart folders. 10-bit color space, which is, I think, only for OpenSUSE, if I remember correctly. Motion graphics support, advanced trim features, and live preview. Builds for Ubuntu, Debian, Arch, OpenSUSE, Slackware, Fedora, CentOS, Mint, and FreeBSD. This is basically like the uh, the fastest updated version. There's, there's like three different versions, which I never realized before. I'm actually going to be trying uh, Cinelera. Flowblade, I'm not sure about Lightworks, but I uh, might also give OpenShot another crack. Oh, uh, that's the news I got for January and February. Links will be in the show notes. If you thought this was useful, please like, share, and subscribe. And I have a very large video coming soon about content creation and what I use to do it on Linux. Because we only use Linux to make these videos. I thank you for watching. I'm Jay. This is DS Tech Media. And we'll see you in the next one.